Hey everyone, this is International Master Michael Brown, and uh, I'm a member of the San Diego Surfers team. And uh, I just wanted to go over one of probably the most, um, I would say, defining games I've ever played uh, since I started chess way back in 2005. Uh, it was a game against Yu Yang Yi, actually, and a uh, very interesting game. I was It was round two of the Chicago Open in 2016. And uh, in a way, it was kind of like the San Diego Surfers were all playing against the Chinese team. So if you look at, if you were to go back in the archives, you would find that uh, I was playing Yu Yang Yi, who is China's number two, uh, the China's one of the China's top players, clocking in about 27.50, I want to say. I think it was about 27.30 for this tournament. Uh, and... My friend Keaton Kira, who is another member of the San Diego Surfers, he was actually on the board next to me, board two, playing another uh, strong grandmaster, Jin Chao Zhou, uh, who was also from China. So yeah, this was an interesting round, and uh, I kind of came into this game with no real expectations. I was black, playing as a 2700. I noticed his first round had been, I mean, it wasn't like the most cl the cleanest win, and uh, so I was optimistic that maybe I'd get a good game. I just came in here, and uh, my whole point was I just wanted to be solid. That was my main uh, objective of this game. So, okay, we're going to look at this game here. Uh, so, I was black, so I'm going to actually flip the board. So, E4, E5, this is just what I usually play against uh, E4. Uh, back then, I only played this Murphy variation, so I decided that would be my choice. I kind of expected Roy Lopez from Yu Yang Yi. He's a pretty well-known E4 player. So none of this was like really, I would say, a surprise to me. I okay, D3. So he, uh, the main line is Rook E1, which you can play after Rook E1. Say you can play B5, Bishop B3, D6. This is what I usually play. And so like White can play like C3. Uh, or you can play even a4 going to an anti-martial uh, So there's a lot of different ways to play this position. You'd also go for a quiet version with d3, which I was a little surprised because I, I don't know I didn't face too much trouble with these uh, slow lines with d3, but okay so a3 uh, And at the time that I played this game it actually recently maybe not recently But I remember I attended a camp uh, run by Wesley So in Southern California run by Metro Chess and he recommended, after Castle's Knight C3, he recommended this move Knight B8. Uh, and he cited a game he played against Anon, I believe, where Anon actually had this crazy novelty he found later with some Knight G5 F4 idea, where basically Anon sacked a piece. Uh, I didn't know if Yu Yangi was aware of this game at, at this time. I was a little nervous that he would do it here, but uh, at the same time, I was like, probably not. I... I don't think he would want to go all out and get someone like me that he probably thinks he can just outplay. Uh, so I figured, okay, he's probably not going to. So yeah, he plays rookie one, uh, which is just a quieter game. Uh, so I'd actually prepped, I, I, I kind of prepped this line up to bishop b6 here. And I just had that this position is about equal. So I was, I was fine with the outcome of this opening. Um, my position is super solid. I'm covering d5. Uh, my bishop here, our bishop is going to get traded, so he's not going to have any bishop domination on this a2 g8 diagonal. And at the same time, my pieces are pretty active. Uh, I have some plans with uh, my knight on c5 is doing well. Um, and all in all, I was I was comfortable. So here he played b4, which was the first new move of the game for me. And uh, I wasn't. Uh, too impressed with this move, but I guess at the same time, it's White's one of White's only ways to try to create an advantage. He needs to create some play on the queen side. That's one of the weird things about this line is that instead of playing for a kingside attack, which is usually what White does in the Royal, he uh, instead opts for a quieter, more positional grind on the queen side. So okay, it's just the player's preference. So he played a four here. And here I probably made uh, a, a slight error. I played this move d five. And uh, d5 is uh, it's kind of optimistic. I'm kind of saying, okay, I'm going to try to uh, open up the position for my bishop here. So that was the whole point, was to try to open up my bishop. Uh, 
And also at the same time, maybe I can get some space in d4, and then I can play knight d7. Uh, but the problem is, uh, so like, say he plays knight e5. I was playing the fall knight e5 with, I believe it was queen d6 or queen c7. I want to say queen c7. And the problem is that I'm, I'm attacking his knight. So the problem uh, before was if I take this pawn right away, he'll just take my c6 pawn, and uh, he's attacking my queen and my bishop. Which means that I'm going to have to move my... I can't take his rook on e1 because this threat on my queen is more lethal. So, okay, I play queen d6, but then he can take here and he has a solid extra pawn. Uh, which would not be good. So, I believe I was going to play queen c7. And the whole point is, I'm protecting my c6 pawn and I'm actually attacking his knight. So, it's kind of a double... Uh, kind of just double duty, my queen. And the crazy thing, too, is that if he tries to take, which he's trying to, okay, I'm going to take your pawn, and I'm going to try to defend my knight at the same time, I reply with this move, knight d5. And now I'm attacking his pawn on b4 again. And, in fact, he can't play c3 to protect it because my knight covers c3. So he would, he would have to give up this pawn. And then uh, that would restore material equality, and then I, I felt that I would have the better pieces. My knight e6 is very solid. His knight g3 is a little wayward. Uh, and his rook on a2 especially is probably the main uh, problem in his position. So this is what I was thinking would happen. But he found this very quiet move, bishop d2. And I realized that my move d5 actually made it very hard for me to protect my uh, e5 pawn. So unfortunately, I think I have to take here. He takes e4 is uh, forced. Any other move. And he's going to take d5, and he's going to have another attacker on his with his rook on e5. And... Uh, it's very tough for me to defend this position. So d takes e4, d takes e4, knight e7. I'm just trying to solidify my position here. And uh, okay, so he plays knight f5, very logical follow up, which I was expecting. Uh, I played bishop f6, which it looks a little ugly, I'm not going to lie. But I liked it because of the idea is that maybe I could play g6 at some point and put my bishop back on g7. So I've kind of fianchettoed it. And so this is kind of my hope, was that maybe his 9 f5 doesn't get as much play as uh, I could hope for. Uh, okay, he found this nice from bishop e3. And I knew here I was worse. Um, the point is just like this piece configuration is just very clumsy. And his knight can even go to d6 if I wanted to. d6, and then he can go for some c4. So like knight d6, c4. And I'm not sure I'm a, a big fan of my position. So I was hoping this wouldn't happen. <laughs> I played queen c7 with the idea that I'm going to bring my rook to the d-file in case he goes for knight d6. So here, uh, I think he might have lost the thread of the game a little bit. So at this point, white enjoys a small edge. And uh, I was expecting a queen a1 here. That's the move I expected. And the point is he's threatening to take on b5. And I can't take back with the a-pawn because he would have this rook on a8, and now his queen on a1 is going to actually be attacking the a8 square, so that would actually that would actually result in losing a rook. So I wasn't sure how to meet this. I think I was going to play something like... Um, it's been a while since I played this game. I think I was going to play something like rook b8, and just try to, try to stay solid, but the problem is, okay, after a takes b5, a takes b5, he is now control of the a file, Maybe he would continue with something like rook d1, trying to make use of both the open d files and a files now. And of course, I stand worse in this position. Uh, so this is what I was expecting. You know, get his queen out of the way and then allow his rooks to uh, take control. But here he played knight d2. And I guess his idea was maybe perhaps to go for c4. I think was his main idea, is try to go for c4 and continue to attack this uh, pawn chain here. But this also opened up a very, really interesting possibility for me, which I tried in the game. Uh, because this knight kind of closes up this file here. So now I can actually move my queen freely, uh, which is nice. So with that in mind, I decided to try this interesting move, a5. Um, objectively, it's not the best move, per se. But I thought a5 was a very nice way to put pressure on white. So... The problem is, uh, I, I was a little uncomfortable with playing some slow move like knight b6. 
Uh, again, he might just take and play c4. And I think I'm still okay. Like here, perhaps I can even take this. But, okay, he might even play knight b3. That's another option for him to get, go for. And just, again, try to slowly play on the queen side. And as black, I really don't have a clear plan. Uh, my bishop is still a little uh, misplaced. And in general, I'm not really sure what my next move should be. Uh, so, all in all, but I wasn't very comfortable with just playing slow here. I thought a5 was actually a really interesting uh, dynamic move to try to rest white out of his um, kind of slow, slow game. And so, yeah, this changes the position drastically. White now is it's gotten very dynamic. And of course, the point is um, threatening to take b4 right away. Uh, and the problem also is that uh, if white just takes b5, okay, I might just take b4. And if he, uh, he probably has to trade here, and then he's kind of left with some weakness on c2 that I can take advantage of. Maybe I can play rook a2 or rook c8. And I do have a slightly weak pawn on b4, but it's a lot better placed, I would say, than his pawn on c2 because I have a lot more space in this position. I have the c file that I'm already on, I have the a file that's already open, and uh, his rook on e1 isn't really doing anything right now. So this is what I was kind of hoping for. So he played queen g4, uh, which I thought was interesting. At first I, was, I thought he might have just blundered a pawn, but the point is if I take b4, uh, he's going to check me. And the point is I can't take because of the queen pins, so I play king h8, and now he has this nice with knight f7. And once I saw this, I realized this was his intention with queen g4, was that he doesn't really care about my lo losing the b4 pawn because my f7 pawn is... Uh, much more crucial to my position because now okay now after this he's attacking my rook and he's also defending his rook on a2 so now he actually can take b5 without any problems and the other thing too is if i attack his queen okay he goes back to b3 and uh, now my pawn before is weak and his pieces are working really well he can move his other rook to b1 and all in all this is just not a good position for black Okay, I decided to sidestep this with king h8. It's kind of prophylaxis, and uh, I just thought, uh, this little like king h8, and white really hasn't done anything to solve this uh, intention here on the queen side. And so I basically asked the question, okay, I'm going to stop your threat on the king side, and uh, again, try to see what he's going to do on the queen side. So eventually he takes here. Um... Here I was quite comfortable because I knew that I would take here, and then we get the similar position to what I was showing in that variation before. So again, now the c2 pawn is weak, and he really doesn't have enough threats to drum up on the queen side. So here I was surprised at how comfortable my position was. Uh, I really liked it. So he played rook c1, and at first I thought, like, after rook a2, I thought the pawn was just gone, but he plays queen d1. And here I was kind of was shocked at how the game had gone so far. So, I think after White, after White's slow move in d 2 his position just kind of got really tough after a5. Very critical. And unfortunately, I don't think his decision to take on b5 was best. Uh, I think there was some move like knight b3 that was better. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it's tough to play uh, for, for White in that position. But now we got to this position, I thought, my pieces are so much more active than his. Um, so I think I have a, I have a clear edge here. Uh, so, okay, g6. I'm creating some luff for my king. Uh, he plays knight h6, king g7 with the idea, knight g4. So here I make a, a really, really bad move here. And I think it was because I was playing yu yang yi that I, I played this move. Because um, originally, the best move is just simply h5. And the point is, I'm not afraid of white trading, because it allows my knight to get in the game with knight takes f6, and so his only move to actually protect everything is f3. Otherwise, if he plays something like queen f3 to protect the e4 pawn, I'm going to take c2. It leaves the c2 pawn undefended. Uh, and so he has to play f3, after which I can play even queen c3 here. And my position is, my position is just dominating. After bishop f2, I can play knight d4, attacking this. Bishop takes d4, uh, queen takes d4 as an option, 
And all in all, this is just absolutely dominating. My pieces are a lot better than blacks. And in fact, I think I have a variation that goes like king h1, knight d7, knight b3. And the point is after queen d1, rook d1, I shouldn't have time to take this pawn because he's attacking my knight. But I ignore it. I take it anyway. And the reason why is after rook d7, I have this move rook c3. And I'm attacking his knight. He actually can't defend the knight. Uh, so you'd have to either move the knight or or do something else. But the problem is if he ever moves the knight, like say knight d2, I have this move rook c1. And the back rank uh, weakness shows in this position. Uh, I didn't see this variation in the game. Otherwise, I think I would have played it. Because I think I saw maybe up to here, and I saw knight b3, and I wasn't sure what the valuation was. But it turns out I can just take and play rook c3. And why has nothing better than to just try to salvage the game with something like rook d5 and like h3? He has to he has to create left first king, and then I and then I can then I have this extra b pawn, and I should be winning. Um, but okay, I uh, I missed the, this. I missed the power of this. I played Sid bishop g5. Um, yeah, I. I guess to explain this move, I was a little uncomfortable with his bishop attacking uh, the square on h6. So in every case that his queen somehow got open on the d file, it could be, it could mean a quick mate if he got to the back rank. So I was trying to avoid that with this move, bishop g5. And I also was operating on the principle like my bishop on g5 is much worse than your bishop on e3. It's not attacking anything, uh, so why not trade it off? But what the problem was that his knight on g4 is actually much stronger than his bishop on e3. It actually attacks a lot more squares. It's a lot better placed. And that's why h5 is so much stronger. Because h5 it deals with my, my worst piece as well. It forces him to take it anyway. And so I would get rid of it. And it would also get rid of his best piece, his knight on g4. And his bishop on e3 really can't do anything. So so right principle, but unfortunately the wrong uh, choice of piece to trade. So it's very important when you're playing chess to really know when or when not to trade pieces. I'm going to tell you, that's one of the... That's always been one of the toughest principles for me to grasp, is knowing when I should trade a certain piece and knowing when it's not good. Because I'll... I'll trade a, a piece thinking that I'll have like a better end game, or maybe my piece is worse on principle, but there'll be some dynamic continuation or there'll be some calculated uh, variation that actually shows that it's not that's not the case and that in fact uh, there's something dynamic or something behind this decision. And here this is what I missed. I missed his dynamic uh, response. So bishop g5, knight g5, h4. I missed h4 completely. Um, and Okay, my next move is fourth, 96, but the point is he just plays h5, and he's trying to rip open my king. And uh, I was, I knew I, I knew I'd uh, blown it for sure uh, here. I knew I, my advantage was probably very minimal. And in fact, uh, I would say that objectively it is equal. The point is, uh, his queen and rook are still really inactive, but uh, with this extra h4, h5 move, I've not only allowed him to create space for his king to skip any back rank uh, weaknesses, but now my king is actually uh, has some trouble with the back rank. Uh, so I decided to play knight d4. I just thought, um, just try to go for activity. That's the best way. Block up the d file and uh, just go for a c pawn. As I thought, if I go into c pawn, then the, none of this king side matters because his queen is very uh, dominated, actually, in this position. h6, check. And here... Um, he uh, the unthinkable happened. You gave me offered me a draw here. Um, yeah, I was uh, at first when I heard the the word draw, I wasn't exactly sure that I'd heard correctly, but I could tell that he had whispered it uh, very low. I don't think he wanted anyone to hear, but uh, but a draw against a super GM. At first, I was thinking, wow. What a result that would be to, to play the top seed here and, and draw him. Because everyone was, there was no one close to him in rating at this tournament. Every, the next, next guy might have been 2,600 feet A, and Yu Ying was 2,740 feet A. 
So, not a bad result to draw the top seed with black. And this the position is objectively equal, so why not just, okay, it should, it should be a draw. Um, so why not just take it here? And um, I'm going to stress this is why you should play for the win. Uh, even if you're playing a tougher opponent and you think your position is better, even when you're wrong, got to play for the win. And here I sensed that despite the evaluation that, say, the computer gives, which is equal, um, Yu Yang Yi looked uncomfortable with his position. And that's what mainly drove my decision to play on here, was not because like I thought I was better, but because my opponent didn't seem all that pleased with his position. So I decided, okay, if he's not pleased, then I might as well play on. And I chose to do so. I played this move, King F8. Refusing the draw offer. Um, sometimes I still can't believe that I did that because uh, Keaton will, will he'll mention sometimes when we're talking is that he'll he'll never forget the the draw offer because he heard it too. He was playing on the board next to me, and uh, he thought for sure that I was going to take it. And when I played on, he was shocked as much as I think any of the spectators that were watching. Uh, but I just thought if he's uncomfortable, let's play the song. So he plays 93 here. Uh, and now the positions, uh, it's, it's getting a little complicated. And the point is, um, he's trying to get his knight to d5, which would be, actually be very strong there. And he's also trying to cover the c2 pawn at the same time to give him, give him some more room with his rook and queen. So I played knight of 6, attacking e4. Um, and this was move 34, so we were getting into a little bit of time pressure, but I wouldn't say it was anything major. Uh, that was one thing I would say I was really good at in this game, was keeping my time under check, which I was really surprised, because uh, this is, you know, board one. And uh, a really important game. And I'm not, and I don't get that many chances to play Super GMs. I mean, I've only played three uh, in my entire career, and this was the first time. And so I was like, I gotta make the most of this. So he plays rook b1, and this is the point with knight e3, was that now I actually cannot take with the rook or queen because his knight defends. And if I take with the knight, uh, he can actually just play rook, well, maybe not. Maybe after knight c2, I'm not really sure what you can do here. He might just play, he might just play rook, uh, might just move his knight. Might just move this knight somewhere, like knight c4, attacking e5. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, there was a problem with knight c2, and uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. And I th uh, the main thing was simply that it's too optimistic, is what I remember in my notes. As I said, it's been a long time since I went over this game. But after knight c2. Gosh, I want to say, oh, it might have been, it might have been a move like this knight to c4. And the point is, he's threatening to play queen d8 check. This is his main threat here. So even if I were to take here, he could just check me. Uh, and then I maybe I defend knight e8 or something. But then he takes e3 back, and uh, my position is actually really uh, sketchy. <laughs> to not to mince words, but this pawn on h6 and this queen on d8 create a lot of threats that uh, to me were really nerve wracking. Say I play knight e8 here, for example, he can even take e5 if he wanted to. And the point is he's throwing knight d7 check. And I don't think I have a defense. Um, say I play queen e6, uh, but then knight d7, king g8, now knight f6. Um, and even if he, because the problem is if he takes, if I take, he just takes here and just check me. Uh, but even if I go back, uh, he could even ch take this one. Okay. And now after king g8, okay, maybe not knight of six now because it's no longer mate, but something like even queen e8 here. Queen e8, um, they, uh, even if I take here, I mean, he can take and take f e3. And this is a slightly worse endgame for me, but it should be one I can draw because... Uh, okay, he'll take my b4 pawn most likely, unless I could play rook a4 maybe. Uh, but okay, his king gets activated, he can play king f2, he'll play king f3. And once he does that, it's uh, close to a draw. And at this point, I think Yu Yang Yi wasn't really 
playing for a draw. And at the same time, I almost wasn't, uh, to be honest. I was trying to create some chances. So I took this pawn on e4, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And, okay, it was based on a small flaw. After rook b4, uh, I thought that you need to just blend this move. I need to check. Um, but if you want, you can uh, pause your videos and see why this move isn't, uh, this move 92 doesn't work. What does white have here that uh, makes this move mute, I guess you could say? Okay, so the problem with 92 is that he just ignores it. Goes king f4. And I actually can't take before, which I thought I could do in the game because queen d8 checkmate. And that's it. Game over. And when I saw that, I realized, um, I don't know, I, I allowed his pieces to get a little too active here. Uh, but his queen was still dominated, which I was still pleased. And then I found this name of queen h4. With a double attack, I'm attacking his h6 pawn. But I've also got this other idea. Uh, if white plays a normal move, say like c3, trying to... Well, c3 is not good. Uh, c3 is not a good option. But say he plays something like queen b1, trying to activate his queen. I have this move rook a1, which is... there's And the idea behind it is after queen a1 check, I'm going to play knight e2. And the point is his king has nowhere to go but f1. And after queen h1 check, I skewer his queen. And then after king e2, I take his queen, and I think I'm winning this position. And so with queen h4, I thought I'd been really, really clever, because uh, I'm also threatening to take his pawn as well if he stops the first threat. Uh, so here, Yu Yang Yi, uh, it was move 37, so I guess, I think he was low on time here, so he decided to play rook b8 check, and then check here. So I realized here that I was, I really don't have a, a good place to go with my king, uh, other than to go back to f8. Um, because any other place, he allows his pieces to get active. Uh, like king f6, knight d5 check, for instance, is really dangerous. Uh, or knight g4 check as well. And so there's nothing better than go back. So he repeated again. But here we made it to move 40. So this was, um, this was a very critical moment. I was almost... He had offered me a draw earlier, so I was almost expecting a perpetual to happen, rook b7 back, and a perpetual. Uh, but using Yi, I guess, decides to play for the win. He plays his move rook b1. And, okay, it covers my rook a1 check threat, which is the whole point. But, again, like I was saying, it's not my only threat. I just took the pawn. So I was thinking, it's an interesting decision, but I didn't really see how he would follow it up. And then he played this move queen e1. And I realized that this move is actually really strong. And it's actually amazing how strong this move is. It looks really innocuous uh, at first glance. You know, this move is queen on the first rank. But there are a lot of different variations that I have to uh, see. The main point is he wants to play queen before check and displace my king on e7. And the other idea is that if I play some normal move, say rook Try to cover. Maybe I try to cover the eighth, eighth rank here, or the seventh rank. Queen b4 check, and if I play king f6, trying to hide on g7, uh, he'll play knight g4 check, forking my queen and king, and uh, forcing immediate resignation. Uh, so my king would have nowhere to go. So like king e8, queen b6, king e8, queen b8. I mean, and both times I lose my rook on a7. This would be game over. So I realized I have to be really precise here. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this is a, uh, really critical position. And, uh, if you want to, you could, uh, pause the video here as well and just try to find Black's best move here. And I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of variations. And I don't expect you to see it all through the way. It took me about 15 minutes when I played this game to see it, all the variations and make the right decision. Uh, so I would uh, spend some a lot of time here if you really wanted to try to solve this. So Black's best move in this position.
Okay. So, um, I guess if you uh, pause the video, that you've hopefully given some lines and uh, try to see what the best move is. Uh, best move here, queen h5. And uh, this is the only move in this position. Every other move loses, which was amazing to me. That such a move like queen e1 would cause uh, this kind of precision to be needed. So, at first I was planning to play queen g5. I thought, okay, I'm throwing knight f3 check, you know, I'm defending e5, and I'm getting out of all the uh, knight g4 forks here. So I thought this move was, like, really nice. But the problem is queen b4 check, and after king f6, he has this really brilliant move, queen f8, which stops my king from coming back to g7. That's, like, the main point. And uh, he's also trying to play queen d8 check. Now, unfortunately, I can't. There's no reasonable way for me to solve these problems. Uh, I could try knight e6, but then knight d5 comes. And after king f5, queen takes f7. He's going to take e6. Game over. So queen g5 doesn't work, and for the same reason, in fact, queen h4 doesn't work, which is crazy. Queen b4, king f6, queen f8 again, and. Uh, I think there's like a variation where he could, where I could do this and check. Actually, let me go back. Queen h4. Yeah, this move, this this move loses to something else entirely. Actually, sorry, that's my bad. But queen h4 here, he has this. To me, is just like this beautiful move, knight f5 check. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Knight uh, f5 wins. The reason is, uh, I really have no better way than just take the knight. Uh, if I take with g, queen e5. And the point is, if you place king f8, I just rook b8. And uh, the problem is, this queen covers this escape square. My king cannot go anywhere. So this is just resigns. Uh, so if I take with a knight, same story. Queen e5, and my king has no safe square. And a sample variation would be like king d7, rook b7. King d8, queen c7, king e8, rook b8, and checkmate next move. So, so, we have to avoid this queen before queen f8 idea, but at the same time, we have to avoid this knight f5 and this knight g4 idea. And the only move that solves all those problems instantaneously is queen h5. Only move. And the other thing, too, is um, that it gives my king an extra escape square on h6. So, if I were to try to run, uh, I have h6 as an option. So here, uh, Yu Yang Yi uh, messed up. Uh, he put this move knight d5 check, which I think I would say was his first real mistake of the game. He had made some inaccuracies before, but this was just a true uh, mistake. He has to go for a draw here. Um, the point is, uh, say, queen b4, king f6, queen f8. So there's no way I can avoid this uh, idea. But what I did avoid was queen f was knight f5 check. This resource no longer works because my queen could just take the knight, and then there's no mate. So he would have to have to queen h5, go queen b8, or queen b4, or king h6, queen f8. And here I can just check and do what I did before with taking this rook. But now, well, I can play queen d6. And after king g7, queen e5 check, I can play like king f8, but okay, he goes... In fact, king f8 might not even be good, but king g8, for example, queen e8... And there's nothing better for me than to accept per perpetual here. Like, if I play for f6, queen e7. And this is actually looking really scary after king h6, knight g4. So this is not good. Uh, but it would be a draw a repetition in this position. This is what I expected in the game. Um, but I guess, I think you really wanted to go for the win here. Uh, the other move, actually, rook b7 is also a draw. But I think this is a little more... Uh, interesting, like how it is, because after King F6, I thought Rook B7 was bad, because I didn't see what his follow-up is here. Uh, I just cover everything, but he actually has this really nice move, F3, uh, that I did not see at all. And I don't think I don't know if he saw it at all either. Uh, but it's just like a very quiet move, which I couldn't believe. The point is literally like he's going to play Knight G4 check. That's <laughs> his only idea is that he's covering G4 and he's protecting it for when his knight comes in. So after king g7, knight g4, okay, I take this, but then he takes f7, and it's a draw. 
but you play 9d5 check, which is a uh, worse move, unfortunately. Uh, after king f8, my king is just getting to g7, and there's no way for him to stop the game now. So you played knight f6, which at first I was actually really nervous about. Um, because it's like he's really getting uh, close to my king. Am I getting mated? <laughs> I, was, I was asking myself during the game, like, am I getting mated in there? And then I saw this variation, queen f5, rook b8, king g7, and now king h6. And now you can see why it was really uh, key for my queen not to be on h6 also, was to allow my king to get escape square to h6. So he plays queen e3 check here. And here, uh, the best move, which I was really happy to find, queen f4. And they, and they might be screaming, okay, what, I mean, queen h3, king, I mean, come on. But then here, king g5, I want to ask you, what does white do here? White cannot continue his attack. His knight and rook are wayward, out of play. And I'm threatening a one-move mate with rook a1 check. So he would have to come back to rook b1 to stop that. And then after rook c2, it's just losing. Um, I'm threatening queen f2 now. And uh, my king is actually really safe. So after f3, I can just play h5. And my king goes back to h6. And after that, it's completely over. I'm just up two pawns and an end game. So he plays the best move, queen takes f4. Uh, but here, I'm just up a pawn. So, oops. I'm up a pawn here. So he plays this move, b7, attacking f7. And I decided to give up uh, h7 instead. I decided to give up this pawn. There's no way I can save it. But uh, we were both in some uh, time pressure here. So this kind of turned into a time scramble. Uh, but... I think I got the better of him in that rook time scramble. So rook f7, I check him, play rook f1. And the point is if he plays f3, I'm going to play knight e2. And I'm going knight g3 and I'm going to mate him. Which I was like really hoping was going to happen. But okay, he played knight h7. Uh, and then knight f8. And uh, giving me the second pawn. But now he's trying to play against my g6 pawn. If he can secure my g6 pawn, I think it's a draw. Because these pawns are not strong enough to overtake it. And also note that um, if, uh, let's say, like, I have an extra pawn in the endgame, so like an f-pawn versus rook and knight, um, he could sack his knight for my pawn. And so it'd be rook and knight versus rook. And the problem with that is that it's actually a theoretical draw. So that wouldn't work uh, in this case, because here I'm trying to play for a win now. Um, but... I was going for more at this point. So I played knight f3 check, king h3, and knight e5. Rook e7, trying to displace my knight. So I can move like king f6 is uh, not a blunder, because rook e6, I have king f7. But, so this is winning, but I thought I really wanted to find a knockout blow here. And I found I found one that was really nice. I played this move knight g4, surrounding his king, putting him in a mating net. And then after rook e6, starting to take my pawn again. Rook f1. And the point is, even after white so he takes the spawn, rook takes g6, king h5, he has no way to stop mate. Uh, if he tries to get out with g3, I simply take away his escape square with this pawn. And his king is just stuck on h3, he has no viable checks, and uh, the game was o the game's over. So he, he actually resigned after I played rook f1. Um, yeah, that was... I have to say, probably, I wouldn't say this is even my best game, but um, this is probably the result that really showed me I can play with these world-class players. Um, in fact, in this during this tournament, I was still FIDE Master. Um, so this was actually the tournament where I secured my last International Master norm, and uh, that was a really good feeling. And in fact, after this win, I was close to a GM norm, but unfortunately, I fell short. Uh, but... Uh, this game is it was all about just uh, persevering, and you, you mean these guys make mistakes as much as the next player, and uh, so it was really nice to uh, get to get to capitalize on that in one game. I'm sure if I played a ten game match with you, he beat me probably seven or eight times out of ten. Uh, he's a very strong player, especially two years ago when I was playing this tournament. Uh, but um, sometimes like. These guys are, these guys are human. They they make mistakes. Uh, they 
miscalculate. They misunderstand positions just as much as we do. Uh, so I just got to remember, uh, even these Titans, you know, like MVL and these guys, they'll, they'll have those moments where they sometimes they don't play their best. And uh, so even though the, you, you offered me a draw, I was uh, really impressed with myself for not taking it, uh, which just goes to show you sometimes, you know, there's a lot of times where I've refused to draw and lost instead. Uh, and those hurt, but those are also great learning experiences. And those also get you uh, ready to uh, refuse the draw even quicker next time. Say if you have a better position, uh, always refuse to draw and play for a win would be my philosophy. So if, if I'm objectively better, then there's no reason for me to take a draw against a better player, lower player at all. Uh, and so I try to put that into action in this game. And I think I really I did well with that. And uh, the result, I mean, you don't get, it's not often you get to play these super GMs, but when you do, you just got to make the most of it. Uh, so, yeah, this is probably my most uh, milestone kind of victory. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, this is, this is really recent, and this kind of inspired me to keep playing because uh, I'm in college right now, and so it's harder and harder as I, get older to travel and to play. But after this game, I thought I could, I could really be something maybe if I were to, just, if I were to keep playing and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, um, uh, inspiring to see this level of play from, from me. And, uh, so I hope you enjoy the video. This is just uh, analysis of my game is Yu Yang Yi. Uh, I know it's not the it's not no tactical spectacle that maybe you're hoping for as a, as a viewer, but um, you should go see a Josh Shang's game if you want to find tactical spectacles. He, he's on the San Diego Surface team, and he is all about calculation. <laughs> so I recommend him if you want to find a, a really nice fighting battle. But uh, anyways, hope you enjoyed, and thanks for watching.